Welcome back to uh, this new set of uh, AlphaGo slash master commentaries. I'm Chris Garlock, and I'm here with Michael Redman, Nidon professional. Michael, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Michael is in Japan. I'm in Washington, D.C., and you are watching this around the world. So welcome. Uh, once again, we're going to be doing a 30-minute commentary on a game of uh, Masters that Michael has selected. Uh, he's going to hit some of the major points. These games are all available in SGF files. We will be releasing them on the same days as we release the video. So you can actually go to usgo.org, get the SGF file, and follow along. Um, Michael's going to hit the major points. He's not going to go too far into the variations. Uh, he may try to go there, but <laughs> we'll, yeah. we'll, see, we'll see what happens. Uh, but we really want to keep these to 30 minutes so that uh, we can make them uh, widely available. So without uh, further ado, Michael, let's go ahead. And uh, what have you got for us here? Well, this, in this game, it's uh, Magist against, uh, let's see, it's Shea Erhao, uh, one of the top Chinese players. And um, it's Magist is just another name of uh, Master. So it's um, the new version of AlphaGo that I'm calling Master. Okay. And in this game, Master is going to show us. Um, he Master has white, and he's going to show us a new um, way of playing a Jose who we, we we think we know fairly well. So up to this point, Black is playing a fairly um, fast-moving game, and um, so trying to take uh, control of as much area on the board. And this is a, a point of the game where black on the left side of the board has something we call the Kobayashi-style opening. And so it's, it's, it looks very fam familiar to the Kobayashi-style opening, only um, in that opening, uh, the upper right corner stone would be on the star point at the mark point. And so uh, what, mastered, uh, what we, you would usually expect is some kind of wide Kakario, a wide approach move like this or like this. And I put some variations in, like um, uh, something like this is uh, what would happen, what has happened in some of my games, for instance, or something like this. Um, many players will probably recognize these variations as sort of standard ways to handle Black's opening. But that's not what happened. Um, White played the high Kakari. And when uh, Kobayashi Koichi started playing this opening, um, and originally, people were playing this move, but um, it was decided that it's not very good um, because Black and Pincer here. And um, the most popular Joseki at that time was to jump out. And so you would end up with something like this, in which case the mark stone um, on the left side is working very well to stop White from doing anything on the left side. And Black is basically taking both the left and the upper side and white has a heavy group in between. So this is a complete disaster for white. It actually happened in uh, one or two professional games, I think. Um, generally, th I think those games were at the er early stage of when Kobayashi was introducing this new opening that he had, and he was clobbering some people when they played this way. And so since this is so bad for white, um, that's, that's basically the reason that players started playing uh, mostly this variation, uh, although um, people can play that move. Um, this is also pretty popular. So um, something like this is what people came up with as a counter um, procedure against the Kobayashi opening. And then later on, people started playing the um, the high, the high Kakari also, which is um, basically that was started by Gosegen in his 21st uh, century opening and stuff like that, where he was um, suggesting people should play this move more. And the idea, Michael, is to uh, settle pretty lightly or just to treat the area lightly and not and not wind up with that heavy shape as you were showing. Well, explaining a simpler with this Karkari, so I'll do it here. Okay. Um, basically, it's um, when you play a Karkari close to the cornerstone, um, it's easy for your opponent to pincer you like this. Sure. But if you play further away, uh, when black pincers, 
it's easier for white to get a trade by uh, attaching the 3-3 point. And um, if this is one standard Joseki variation. Um, stuff like this would be um, good for white because the black stones on the left side here, um, these stones here, um, are not really very important. They would be better it would be better to have them in places like this on in other parts of the board. So black has a kind of a not completely wasted, but partially wasted move on the left side of the board. And this is not very good for black. And so the trade is good for white. And that's why, uh, that's the reasoning behind uh, this move in which white is saying it's, it's gonna be difficult for black to play a good pincer move. So white is basically avoiding a immediate fight and looking for a more peaceful variation like this in which um, black does get a lot of territory on the left but white's avoiding an immediate fight and can um, basically make better use of the komi is okay. what i think the idea is yeah but you can also uh, pro probably uh, play away as well right at that point white would probably play away uh, white could play away or um let's see play away like this mm -hmm. or could uh if white was uh, wanting to play very solidly, white could play again here, right. and this would be threatening black on the upper side also. So it would be basically sente. Black would probably answer with something like this, and then white could play to the left side. Okay. Yeah. So this would be a more pacific game, and, and black would not be making the immediate attack against white. Um, but that's not how AlphaGo chose to play, or Master. Um, Master actually played the high Kakari. And we had always thought that this was bad because Kobashi Koichi had done so well at um, beating up people who had done it before. Um, but then he played this move, which looks sort of unreasonable with the marked black stone. And, and so there's the question of what happens when black breaks through. You had a this question? Is, no, this is not a Joseki, right? This this uh, move by white? Well, if the, black, the marked black stone wasn't there, it would be a, a fairly common Joseki. But um, just because of the fact that there's this extra black stone on the left side, um, people would think that it's an overplay now. Okay. Um, when black pushes through. But it turns out, um, and so we haven't really thought about this very deeply because it just looks um, so unreasonable. Mm -hmm. As but a it professional. Turns out, as a professional, yeah. Um, but uh, it turns out this is the only way black can cut white. So this is the move that white has to be worried about. And the game progresses. Um, so far, it's looking sort of like a Joseki sequence, but mm -hmm. since Black does have that extra stone, like if Black had played here, it would be a very common Joseki sequence. Sure. And, and even even the way we've been playing it, it, you would expect something like this, which would just be pretty normal. And then you have to uh, think of the fact that actually what AlphaGo, our master, likes to do is push through and capture the one Black stone. And so this would probably be playable for white too. Um, and so this is a completely new version of the Joseki that um, that we haven't been seeing until very recently. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll be getting into that more deeply in a different game, actually. So I'll leave it at there. Um, okay. I was, this this was game was sort of intended to be a kind of introduction to to this uh, the way that AlphaGo is using this this whole Joseki on the in the upper left corner in a different way than it has been before. In this case, since black does have extra stones, black can play more strongly. Um, for instance, um, usually this is an overplay. Um, in the Joseki, Joseki books, you will be told that black cannot play this move because mm -hmm. white can push through and cut. Um, and if black plays in the corner, the ladder is gonna be, I'm pretty sure either way, this is gonna be a good ladder for white. Yes. Yeah, the ladder is gonna work. Sorry about that. that that's uh, <laughs> it. Definitely uh, doesn't work. The ladder works for white, uh, yeah. and but actually in this position, uh, black can save the upper stone, and um, uh. we'll have no problem living underneath. And with this extra stone here again, the marked stone will come into play, and white's going to be in a lot of trouble here. And so with this extra black stone, it's going to be good for black. So this is a good chance to talk about uh, Joseki's then, because you mentioned a little while ago that 
you know, professionals haven't thought deeply uh, about uh, that Joseki with the Mark Stone there. Um, and but Josecki's are well, actually go ahead and, and talk about what Josecki's are and and you know, without going too deeply into the history, but mm -hmm. there is a history to Josecki's. Well, yeah, Josecki is just um, basically something that comes up naturally in games, and then people decide that it's a reasonable variation. And mm -hmm. so Josecki is a local position, usually confined just to one corner. Um, usually, we're talking about it in the early stages of the opening. Mm -hmm. And it's just a corner sequence that is that is that people have agreed that it's reasonable for both players. So, like, okay. if it was good for one or the other player, then we would not call it a joseki because it, people would stop playing it. So, and that's changed over time. There's things that that mm -hmm. uh, were not josekis that have become josekis. In fact, they've gone in and out of fashion over the t over the years. Well, you know, um, you're going to get me started talking about <laughs> history. <laughs> because Joseki's yeah. have actually been around for more than a thousand years. Mm -hmm. And you can find ancient Chinese texts that have Joseki. That's actually what people started with in Japan. They had a lot of ancient Chinese books that they looked at. And so most of the ancient Joseki's in China are, are based on a on the Chinese Go rules, which were a bit different at the time. Um, and so they were all for mostly for star points. Um, and, in, the China, yeah. in the Chinese, you had uh, stones actually placed there as part of the game, right? They placed uh, two stones each on the four star points to start the right. game. And right. so in an even game, they would have only star points. Um, and so they had a whole bunch of star point josekis in ancient China. That That's really um, more than a thousand years ago, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, I might be wrong, but it's somewhere close to that. And um, <coughs> Give, give and, or take. Yeah, and those those Josekis are actually um, pretty good. They're not completely ridiculous. Like um, it's not as if they're completely outdated. Um, only they're based on an um, opening with those two stones each um, starting. So they don't really work um, in all of the contemporary openings. And then it's go um, developed further in Japan. Um, especially during the Edo period, um, when there were Go schools, and so they could spend all their time studying Go, they invented a whole bunch of Josekis. And um, they would change. They were fads. And so they, um, in the Edo period, that was uh, about 300 years ago, roughly. It was a 300-year period, so it uh, went up to the Meiji era, which was more than 100 years ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and... Um, they would uh, they would change the Josekis a little bit. Um, people innovated, um, and it was an era where Go was flourishing a lot. So they um, they had a good a lot of good players who would have their own pet ideas, and they would invent a whole bunch of Josekis. So basically, a Joseki stops being a Joseki if people decide one side is better than the other, and then they find a better way for the opponent to play. And, and all of which is to say that you know. AlphaGo plays this move, which you wouldn't even think about for five seconds. But right. if AlphaGo can find a way to make it work, then you as a professional have to rethink that, right? Yeah, I, I really think I should start calling, trying to be calling it master. Um, okay. Because, because it is different in the way it plays a, in, a, in a number of ways from AlphaGo. It's, it's it evolved. So I'm, I'm going to try to call it. I, I'm calling it AlphaGo sometimes also, but I'll try to call it master. Um, Basically, I think if a lot of pros start taking up these moves and decide they're good and, and imitate the computer, basically, um, if a lot of pros are playing the move, then it can be called a Joseki move. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as we decide that one side is better or the, the other side is not so good, um, then people will stop playing that way and find a different move. And I think for amateurs, one of the things is that, you know, we study these Josekis and I, I think... You know, I'll be the first to admit, I think, you know, there's a tendency to follow them fairly slavishly, you know, that oh, that's mm -hmm. Joseki and that's not Joseki, as opposed to looking at it and thinking, hmm, that's interesting. Well, yes. Also, there, this, this, I'll just uh, take the game position. This is where I played. And we ended up with um, this trade, which locally is good for black. Um, like, in a Joseki book, you would say this was a success for black, and it's a bad local result for white. Um, but then you have to take in um, the the whole board position, where black already has two stones on the left side. 
um, these two stones, which would have made any kind of fight bad for white. So white had to play cautiously here anyway. So a slightly better than ideal result is good enough for white in this particular area. And so the way people play um, will change depending on the surrounding stones also. It always depends on the whole board position. And this is a kind of a position where Joseki would be too, too good a result for white. Whereas white can afford to have a slightly disadvantaged position in this local area because white has more stones elsewhere on the board. And I guess one of the things that I wonder, and I think we saw this with, with AlphaGo, and maybe you're seeing this even more with Master, um, and, and certainly for the difference between amateur and professional play, right? For uh, a professional, you can look at a position and you'd say this is a better position and you you may mean that it means one or two points, mm -hmm. which would be obviously you know impossible for an amateur to see. I'm wondering if Master, you know, as you say, can have a position that seems a little bit uh, disadvantageous locally, but it's looking at a much broader, maybe much finer tuned uh, mm -hmm. position. Is that what you're saying? Well, um, any professional player does look at the whole position. Mm. Um, <laughs> and like this uh, position I have on the board right now is an example of that, where if you're just talking about Joseki, um, Black has a whole bunch of Joseki, like uh, this move, a move here or here, um, a move here. You can find all of these moves in a Joseki book. Mm. Um, but black wants to find a move that works well with black's position on the left side of the board. And <clears throat> so um, you could play a Joseki move, like you could play this move, and you would be told that that's not good. I would, I would say that that's not good for black because white gets to play the extension, and then black has to worry about this stone here moving out and attacking the black stones on the upper side. And so this is a position where uh, black has to choose which Joseki to play at the very least, uh, or maybe even choose a move that's not a Joseki to match the overall position. And that's something that pros are doing all the time. And <clears throat> it's also true of a lot of master's moves, because um, especially in the upper left corner here, master is playing a move that usually is bad, but it works well with the overall position, or, the, mm -hmm. or at least the left side position. Um, and so pros would consider playing this move or imitating this move in the exact le same left side position. Mm -hmm. uh, I would be willing to try it out in this position, but definitely not if it was just the one corner or if it was just a, 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 a position without those extra black stones on the left side. Um, I would definitely not play this way for white. So it's a, it's a move that's sort of tailored to this particular um, board position. Um, and because of that, it was sort of hitting a blind spot in our professional knowledge because we would sort of tend to discard um, this way of playing just because locally it's bad. All right, so we've got uh, just, a, just a little over 10 minutes left. I want to make sure we get to your other major points in this particular game. Well, the, the fight got really interested in the upper right, too. Um, and this is actually the, the fi decisive fight here. Um, the games actually um, tip in Masters' favor very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and so like one mistake and um, then the ma master sort of jumps on it. And this is a position where it looks like uh, master played an overplay. At this point in the Joseki, again, we have a Joseki position that uh, master did not play the Joseki move. The Joseki move is this move. Um, the idea is that if black answers something on the left, um, if black answers something on the left, then uh, then white can um, extend the outer stone. And because of this exchange here, this exchange here strengthens white's upper side group. Mm. Like if, if white had played here, um, let's say here, then we mm. can see that the white stones on the upper side are in a lot of trouble. And this, this is um, kind of thing that could happen, but already white doesn't really have very much room on the upper side. White's going to be very cramped here. Although I'm not going to say white's going to die. White's going to be very cramped. Um, let's let's have a potential variation like this. Oh, and, that's so and, painful. Ouch. Um, something like this could happen, which would be, yes, very painful, and white's going to get attacked again. And this is all because white was so cramped there. And so going back to the beginning of this variation, 
um, with this exchange in, then of course it's a completely different story because even if black does play here, there's going to be um, a hole and white will be able to push through. So this is sort of an example of um, how that one attachment there can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. And so going back to the joseki, you usually have black um, extending here to finish off the stone on the right side. And then white will, uh, this is a basic joseki. Actually, this would be good for white. Um, but at this point, when black has so many stones in the area, I would expect black to play more aggressively like this. And maybe this is not so good for white because white has a floating group up there. It's not completely alive. And um, with all the extra stones um, that black has on, on the left, it looks like white's going to have trouble counterattacking. Mm -hmm. So this is this is the variation that is actually not a joseki, but it's a variation that pros have played a lot that I think that master, maybe you might say master read it out and didn't like it. I, um, I'm, yeah. you, don't, you don't like it either. I don't like it either. And so it came up with a non joseki move, which was this. Um, now, <laughs> this is locally an overplay. It, it totally looks like something I would play. I mean, just and it's it is an overplay, right? I mean, it's just. Well, it's it, I've seen it in a number of professional games, but only with a white stone somewhere on the right side. So I put a marker at A uh -huh. to indicate um, that would be an ideal place to have a white stone. Sure. If white has a stone at A, then it would work very easily. Actually, anything, anything, any white stone on the right side uh, would make this move sort of possible, um, provided you're ready for a big fight. I was going to yeah. say this is this is big fighting style, right? Mm -hmm. So, and actually, uh, the the Hane and connection here is the basically it's the key point, vital point in shape. So this is the only move Black has, and uh, White plays once here to um, sort of get an entrance into the center for his upper side group, and then jumps. So this is a sequence that actually has happened before. Um, and at this point, if black pushes, uh, okay, now that's the right, that's the correct move. If black mm -hmm. pushes through here, white's going to be crawling for a while. And we'll be able to kill the corner. White has, uh, at, at this point, white has six liberties and black has only five. And black cannot really extend his liberties. So black still has five at this point. So this is an example of how immediately attacking doesn't work for black. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go back. Uh, what black did was black played here. Black has to play something towards the corner to make a living shape. Right. But actually, right. this was the best move. And I put in some variations. I don't think I should go into them now. Basically, no, they... the idea is that if white covers here, then black can do this. And this exchange here is going to make the difference. So uh, we have this. This fighting, um, white white cannot actually kill the corner very easily. Like uh, playing at A, I didn't do that. Okay, playing at A is is not going to kill the corner unconditionally. Like if white just plays this way, it's alive. Um, and so it's much more difficult for white to kill the corner. So this move doesn't work. Um, um, and crawling, uh, even though white can crawl. White has to play something like this to kill the corner. And um, we get this kind of, um, I think people should just go into the variations if they're interested. Yeah. And, and then black's going to have a good result, like black can win this semi. And I put a whole bunch of variations. Um, if you don't like this kind of thing, uh, some of the watchers, should, viewers should just ignore those variations. But the, the end result is that if black does play, uh, if that black does play this way, white probably has to do something about the right side. And so this crawling at, at P18 here, this um, crawl on the second line is a vital point in shape. And it, um, of course, black's alive in the corner. This is also helping out the black stones on the upper side and taking away white space. And so this fight would be good for black. And I think actually um, if black had played this way, it would have been um, difficult mm. for master. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, this move was actually a mistake because after white played here, um, now white can kill the corner and win the semi. Like um, I put a variation in, I think it's this one. Yeah, where white white can just fill in fill black's uh, liberties with this move. 
And uh, we can see white has six liberties and black is not going to get more than five. Um, and I put a variation where black tries a co-kind of thing, but it's, it's just painful for black. And so when black is covered on the third line like this, this becomes a forcing move. Whereas if black had played on the second line, this would not be a forcing move. So that's the big difference. Gotcha. And so in the game, uh, white pushes here, actually giving black an opportunity to take the, the two marked stones, um, which would lead to this variation in which white is getting a lot on the upper side. So black didn't do that. And um, in, in the actual game variation, we have white alive on both sides and black is floating in the center. And just to take you a, a bit further into the game, um, we, we see white is just sort of um, switching to the attack here. And at this point, it's pretty clear that white's gonna win because um, white's taking territory while attacking black on the right side. White's alive on the upper side. Um, white's, white's right side group is not completely alive yet, but it's a lot stronger than the black side group. And black in the center is also um, not very strong. So everything has just gone very, very bad for black at this point. Um, so to, to sort of sum up and ramp up, uh, you've got two really good examples of uh, master playing a non joseki move that turns out to to work pretty well that and people mm -hmm. think about that and then uh in th this other example that you were just looking at uh where just a, a you know really a pretty small uh, mistake it's a, a, a sort of non another non joseki move um yeah that the mistake that, yes yeah and yeah, this mistake was, it, it made a huge difference in the flow of the game. It actually made a almost a one move difference. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I have the feeling that Master has a tendency to play fairly <clears throat> simply when it thinks it's going to win. <clears throat> and then it plays very, very complicated variations when it's not so happy with the game. So I think this, I'm not really sure whether Master liked the position in the upper left. Um, my hypothesis is, is that maybe it didn't really like it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not really sure about that, but it, it, it's a, um, a Joseki type move that, it's an, that could become a new Joseki for the left side position, if you include the extra stones on the, the, on the side. So let me ask sort of a macro question as, as, we, uh, as we wrap up here. Um, and I think you've said this before mm -hmm. that you, you you prefer to call it master because you feel like it's it's really sort of reached a different uh, level than than the AlphaGo program that uh, we saw last year. Um, so what are the what would you say are some of the hallmarks that you're seeing in in master that are different than we saw in AlphaGo? Well, it's it's different in almost all parts of the game except for the end game, mm -hmm. um, but. Um, the biggest difference, obviously, is the opening, mm -hmm. in which it is playing, um, it is starting to play moves that we haven't seen before, which AlphaGo was not. Well, AlphaGo was playing pretty conservatively in the opening, and I can remember it, it really played a 3-4 point. And when it did, it was with Black, and it was playing the Chinese opening. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, and so now it's it's playing um, star points and 3-4 uh, points in with the 3-4 point uh, pointing in either direction, or it can play two, three, four points. <clears throat> and um, also, I'm going to be, um, hopefully through this series of videos, I'll be showing you various other moves that are, some of them are almost, are brand new, some of them are old moves that were not very popular, and, and Master is making them work. Um, and so it, it's doing a lot of innovative, um, I would count about 20 new moves um, that I, I want to show you in the six, the 60 game series. Um, so a lot of stuff coming up in the opening. And then after it takes control of the game, it um, I, I, I've noticed that um, in the middle game, as it approaches the end game, the way it um, simplifies the board mm -hmm. is very clever. It, it, um, it's very good at simplifying the overall position and quickly entering the end game. Like, for instance, in Japan, Ishida Yoshio was called the computer. Yes, he was. Uh, 
because he was uh, very good at counting um, territory or judging the overall position. And also his reading ability was considered good. And so when he was on the top of the ghost scene, he was called the computer. And he was also very good at simplifying the board when he thought he was ahead. Mm -hmm. um, and so that his master sort of resembles Isha in that way. Um, and it's a very important um, thing to be able to do because uh, the opponent obviously will, will be trying to create confusion as it becomes clear that um, the game is being, is, uh, as it becomes clear that one side is ahead, the other side will start to um, try to start a fight or something. And so simplifying is, is not so easy. Your opponent's not going to let it happen so easily. Mm -hmm. um, but he's very good at sort of taking control and forcing the flow of stones. And then in just a few moves, what you thought was a middle game position is turned into an end game position. And basically, the, the definition of an end game position is a position where you don't have any groups that are potentially going to die or be attacked. So like you, if all of the groups on the board are living and um, the control of most of the wide open areas is pretty much decided, then you're en entering the end game. And so Master is very good at taking it from the middle game to end game. And then, of course, it messes up in the final par parts of the game, uh, but it doesn't do it so badly as to lose. Like it's it's as if it's playing with the playing with the human, right? Uh, by just giving back a few points. Sure, the uh, the house advantage it feels like sometimes with some of those games. Well, that's mm -hmm. going to do it for uh, this game commentary. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. Uh, it's thank been you. It's really. My Fascinating, and I'm uh, looking forward to uh, seeing uh, the rest in this series. So thanks again to Michael Redmond, Nine Don Professional. Thank uh, you. Chris, Chris Garlock uh, here, and uh, we will see you next time. Thanks for watching.